Hi, this is Mark Vina with more insights and strategy with yet another podcast and some really uh, intriguing disruptive technology companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, today, I'm having another podcast, and today's, today's session is a video podcast with a very disruptive company called Ergo. And Ergo is a interesting technology company because it's really focused on the, what I like to call the smart hearing aid device segment. And this uh, particular podcast is really focused on the technology itself, which is why we think the video um, approach would be so important. And with today's session, I'm very, very pleased to have um, John Alsa, who is the director of design engineering, the, uh, the brains, so to speak, behind the, uh, the products themselves, and uh, Tim Trine, who is the uh, uh, chief technical officer at Ergo. Please welcome them to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you know, a lot of people, frankly, don't um, understand sometimes the, the, the richness of the technology that go into some of these products. And before we get into that, what I'd like to do is maybe Tim and, um, and John, you could talk a little bit about your backgrounds and sure. how you got to uh, Ergo. Sure. So my background is in hearing science initially. I was going to be a career academic, uh, PhD from the University of Minnesota and started a uh, faculty, tenure track faculty position at Vanderbilt University. Um, <clears throat> and ironically, about six months before accepting a position within the so-called hearing aid industry, I, uh, somebody asked me that question if I would consider that. To make a long story short, I accepted a position at uh, Starkey Hearing Technologies, one of the so-called big five within the uh, hearing aid space that uh, those five companies own about 90%, 95% of the global market. Um, and went there to do research, and uh, shortly thereafter was driving product development, and you know, make you know a 19-year career there. Um, what attracted me to Ergo was really the opportunity to focus more on the end user, right? So the incumbents have, uh, because of their direct B2B business rather than B2C have spent a lot of time and energy focusing on their customer, which mm -hmm. is the audiologist or dispenser, rather than the end user. So by the time I uh, left uh, that company, you know, I was spending 60% of our development dollars really focused on features and benefits for the, our customer rather than the end user. And so that's, you know, that's what attracted me here was that it's 100% focus on the end user benefit. And, uh, and that creates a very compelling Easy to come to work and easy to attract talent, and uh, and ultimately the right thing to do for the end user. Well, and that goes back to the topic we I had with um, Ergo CEO uh, Christian uh, Gormson um, in our first audio podcast, where we talked about the fact that you know the, the there's a lot of mythology you know about the hearing aid device um, segment. People feel that they have to go and get a, get a um, a doctor or some type of audio specialist. Uh, prescription for a hearing aid device and that really has changed dramatically over the last couple of years and I think the fact that you know Ergo is trying to really promote their their value proposition directly to consumers right. and not worry about the middleman so to speak I think it's, that's a big deal absolutely and it's it's not to suggest that we don't believe that that care is important right, right. it's just that we think we can do it a little bit differently a little mm -hmm. bit more efficiently Right, so it's not a naive approach to that. It's a product only centric, product centric mm -hmm. solution. It's a product solution along with that important audiological support right. and care that is essential for a successful um, user. Yeah, and doing it consistently as well, because we, not to turn this into a channel discussion, sure. but the channel of of, of uh, dealers that sell classic audio uh, hearing aid products. You know, the, the quality can vary. You know, uh, you can have a, a mom and pop type of place which may have good quality, you go to another place five miles away, which may not be quite as good. So I think the, the mission of Earth, that Christian has for Ergo, uh, trying to make sure that we have, uh, that you guys have consistent, um, you know, high quality, you know, le uh, really strong level of excellence from a uh, from an engagement standpoint with uh, consumers is pretty important. But let's turn our attention to the young youngster in the group. And you look like you're 15, but I know you're not 15. <laughs> uh, and we won't disclose this age. Um, uh, but John, tell us about your background, how you got here, and uh, you know your passion for the company, and you know what what you know what's, what's you know kind of gets you up in the morning. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. First of all, um, so I uh, my background is purely product design. Um, so I went to Stanford to get my undergrad in product design. Stanford, I've never heard of that school. Yeah, and then um, 
shortly after graduating, I joined Apple, and I was designing accessories for the iPod and iPhone group. Mm. Um, so I did a number of projects, but kind of the ones that were most applicable to this job um, are I was the architect behind the earpods and the AirPods. So um, after that, I uh, took a couple, a long stint of what I call my fun employment, where I was basically a ski and surf bum exploring <laughs> the world. Right. Um, and then uh, I went back to Berkeley, got my master's in product design and kind of a hybrid business degree, focusing on entrepreneurship and design for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, um, I got a, uh, an email out of the blue from my former VP uh, at Apple, Steven Zadesky, who was advising the Euro board at that time mm -hmm. and still is. Um, so uh, he recommended I come down and check out the company. Um, so I came down and met a bunch of the team. And, you know, I, I was impressed. Uh, it was, what drew me to the company is, uh, you know, it's, it's a good fit for my background in terms of experience. And it was a great opportunity to kind of like uh, contribute to a cause, right? To help a lot of people through product design, mm -hmm. um, which I really love. And that, that still gets me out of bed every day. Um, and beyond that, it's, it's a really interesting design challenge, right? Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a hybrid between consumer electronics and medical space. Um, and, you know, I saw the whole business model as a whole advantage for um, how we can design products for the end customer, right? You're, instead of a B2B business, it's a direct B2C right. business, right? And um, that comes with a lot of advantages for design. You're designing for the end consumer and only focusing on their needs. So, right. um, you know, it's kind of a mix of a perfect fit and uh, a real great opportunity to help a lot of people. And, and what's really fascinating about this particular type of product versus other products, that the, the aesthetic design of the product is important. You know, when you go out and buy a car, you really care about what the car looks like because you want people to see it. You know, and there are other examples like that. But in this particular um, space, you know, you, the consumer finds value because they can see the product. It obviously works behind the scenes because it's, in, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, at a deeper level. It works inside of your ear, uh, so to speak. But you know, one of the reasons why the product is so attractive to people is that you know, people. Uh, there are a lot of people who have moderate um, or minor hearing loss, and they don't want the stigma of wearing external hearing aid. And that is a huge, huge um, competitive differentiator for um, Ergo. So, from a design standpoint, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges with that because it's really interesting designing a product. That works, does what it's supposed to do, but it's a product that can't be that you know achieves its nirvana because it can't be um, physically seen. So let's talk a bit about that. And I'll yeah, yeah. I, the irony is right is that that is one of the big attractions uh, uh, into this uh, into our product line for people and uh, and the delighted customers though the, the first thing they do is pull it out of the air and show everybody. Uh, so it's uh, you know, that's that's a win win for us, right? right. Um, and it's you know it really is designed to be not seen uh, in C two, um, and that you know so the challenges I'll let Jonathan really take the lead on on some of the design the, challenges. De the design challenges. Yeah. Uh, but at a at a high level from a strategy perspective, it's something we ask ourselves you know every every year. Right, is in terms of it, you know, is that continue to be the right direction, and and the answer is definitively yes, mm -hmm. right? because we know this is a very stigmatized product category. People don't you know don't want to be wearing uh, something visible, something that external. brings attention mm -hmm. right. to uh, to a deficit. Um, that invisibility is really core. So from an acoustic perspective, that is really the foundation of where the company started. So the flexi fiber design and now the flexi palm design allowed us to create a product that could sit within the ear canal comfortably and, uh, and in a healthy way. So air exchange as well as the acoustic benefits of uh, kind of suspending that device within the ear canal and allowing uh, the low frequency sounds to come in naturally and exit naturally. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the cornerstone of the acoustic design, but I'll let Jonathan talk about the uh, the industrial design and the other challenges. Yeah, let's do that because I think it's really critical. You guys, from an engineering perspective, and I'm not an engineer because I'm not that smart to be an engineer, but I do appreciate the the, the challenges that engineers approach have when they, they look at an interesting problem to solve. 
and uh, there, there are a number of issues, you know, just from a, a blank slate standpoint that you have to solve when you design for a product like this. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Jonathan. So the, the main challenge is space, right, volume. The, the ear canal is a really tiny uh, constraint, and especially those customers that have extremely tiny ear canals, right? The mm -hmm. smaller we can make our device, the more people we can, we can service, right? Um, so it's a direct trade-off in terms of design simplicity, right? Um, you know, typical product, you, you don't take as much risk on, you know, the exact wall section of your plastics, how thick your flexible circuit is inside, right? Mm -hmm. So we put a lot of thought and effort into every little last micron that we can shave off of the, the product as a whole, right? Every single component in there, we spend a lot of time selecting in terms of minimization, right? Um, so the main challenge is really size. Um, well, let's pause on that for a second because I'm just uh, a curious question just popped into my head is that because you have you know obviously you have little tiny um, the uh, those fiber filters that allow you to adjust for different sizes, but does the app is there an average ear canal size for the for for a human being or is there a lot of variability? It is a an extremely variable part of the anatomy. So. Um, you know, it's, it's also not a very well understood area of the anatomy, so mm -hmm. um, we do our own internal research to define that and to understand better the ear canal and how it's formed, right? Right. Um, so uh, that, um, that helps us define the external geometry, right, and how do we make that as comfortable as possible, what's the average first bend inside the ear canal, and how do we bake that into our design to make sure that it fits the average customer out of the box with mm -hmm. the problems, right? Um, and that kind of informs the overall form factor and shape. So um, particularly in our last launch on NEO, we tried to take that to the next level where we tried to remove any sources of discomfort and smooth out the surfaces to not only make the product prettier, but also make it functionally more comfortable, right? Mm. Um, so if you look at the details um, of how our product has evolved, you know, the NEO is kind of a step up in terms of like how we designed it to be as comfortable and and fit within the most ear canals, right? And that goes down to fairly um, complex aspects of product design. Like we had to uh, rework our tooling strategy to um, make most of the uh, enclosure of the hearing aid differently. Um, and that allowed us to kind of push the limits on decreasing wall sections, making the entire product stack inside as tiny as possible, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, every every little detail that we could push the limits of, we did. So just a walk in the park, you have to design for the variability of the ear canal. Yeah. Uh, it's a product that goes inside someone's ear, so you, you don't have a lot of um, you know flexibility, frankly, design to, to design in such a way that um, allows you to you know uh, alleviate some of the, the the miniaturization and some of the issues that you have to deal with by putting a lot of technology in a very very small uh, form factor. And by the way, we have it, and we'll talk about it. Is uh, the two pieces the fact that you know you, you don't want the person to feel that it's, they're wearing it? That's mm -hmm. that's that's again a, a nirvana type of state. And I'll layer on top of that is that it has to have some type of interface. You know, you and obviously when, when something's embedded in the ear canal, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of opportunity to do that. And there's some very innovative ways that someone can actually, you know, interface with the device as if it, just like any other interface allows you to manage a. Uh, whether it's a mouse or a touch screen or a touchpad. So let, let's talk about that, uh, that uh, element. Maybe I'll turn that over to you, Tim, in terms of some of the, 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 the interesting challenges with that in terms of the interface capability sure. of the product. So obviously we want to be able to allow users to control their, their device, right? Uh, we, we have a one-size-fits-all product, mm -hmm. uh, and so the, and we've done a lot of work uh, from a statistical perspective of understanding the hearing losses uh, that we can fit within our, the fitting range of our product and how does that reduce down to a, a small set of, of gain and compression and uh, configuration uh, settings. So uh, that's challenge number one. So we've reduced that down to four settings. Then the question is how do you allow somebody to change among those programs in a yes. very easy and discreet way, right? So the, the solution for that was what we call an acoustic tap. So a quick tap to the ear allows the user, just based on the microphone itself, to move from one program to the next, one profile to the next, uh, in a very easy way. So that's uh, 
uh, you know, solution number one, and we have, uh, you know, um, as we look forward, uh, we solve that problem in more unique and discrete ways. Uh, but today, that's it's been a very robust and uh, and good solution for people. With Ergo Neo, in addition to that, uh, we've allowed for a connected device, not in the hearing aid itself, but through our charger. Uh, so getting a Bluetooth signal into the head, into the uh, ear canal, is impossible without having an externalized antenna, right? right. And invis since invisibility is so core to who we are as a company, uh, we've decided that that was a non-starter. You don't want to violate that principle. Exactly. Right. So rather, we put a Bluetooth low energy radio in our charger. Uh, and have a mobile app to go along with it, as, as well as a web app for our hearing professionals to interface with, uh, with the device itself. So now the user can customize their preferences uh, through a mobile app, take the hearing aids out, pop them in the charger, wait about five seconds, LEDs you know, stop blinking, and then you can pull it back out and you have a new customized fit. Right. Whether that's brokered from our audiologists uh, online or the end user themselves through our mobile app. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's, you know, it, it, uh, the, the technical challenges with designing a product, it's just am amazing the amount of technology that can be embedded in such a small form factor. And you have to take all these things into consideration when you're uh, designing it. Um, I want to take a, you know, maybe a step up here because given your, your, your pedigree at Apple and uh, is that um, what I have found with a lot of the, the talented design folks that I've either worked with or, or know, is they typically, when they're designing a product, it doesn't really matter what the product is, but they have an aspirational approach. Uh, whether it's a brand, and I know you'll probably say Apple, but are there products or solutions that you look at that are not in the space that you guys are playing in that you look to and says, you know what, from a design standpoint, as we evolve our products, and we're gonna talk about the, um, the Neo product in a little bit a deeper form in a few moments, but are there any type of aspirational Goals. What is your north star from a, from a from a, a technology aspirational standpoint when you design the products? So, I think the the north star is to make the best product for the end customer, right? So, how can we service their needs better? How can we put in um, you know clever features to make their life easier? That that's the most important thing. Beyond that, I think um, you know we we put a lot of thought into like how do we um, create a next product that looks like it's part of the Yergo family, right? Mm -hmm. So brand continuity is kind of important to how we design products also. Sure. Um, in terms of brands or products that I've looked to or we have looked to um, for inspiration, I mean, Apple is obviously kind of the, the golden standard within sure. consumer electronics today. Um, and I think they do a great job of, of brand recognition, right, through, through design. Um, I think other good examples that I find interesting are uh, Tesla. I think their their cars are kind of like a great example of focusing on user needs while embodying that brand image. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as a throwback to former stars in the consumer electronics industry, I think Sony and the Walkman phase is good. good, good, good in the good day, example in the day, too. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And how they evolved from you know the first Walkman to mini to CD players, so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, those those are probably the most pertinent examples. Sure. Well, the, the, you know, and it, it, I think um, the best evidence of all those those goals and 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 the, the north star that you have in place, I mean, is really testament to the products you folks are developing. So, with that, we're teasing this quite a bit. Let's take a look at the uh, the Neo solution. Because, and before we do that, Tim, why don't we just talk about you know why you know, Neo is kind of like your I'm going to use a car reference, a BMW 7 Series. It's the high performance right. model. Not that there's, a, not, there's other models that are terrific, that are great, but it really is kind of test, you know, tested it to the, um, to the premium nature mm -hmm. of, of the Irigo brand. So let's talk about the uh, uh, Neo and um, you know, why, uh, well, first of all, why it's different from other previous models, sure. some of the improvements and enhancements you've brought to it. Um, and then we'll do a quick overview of the product itself so people sure. can actually see it. Sure. So, you know, the, the biggest difference in, in Neo is, is evidenced by the size of the box, right? Mm -hmm. So while, you know, moving, getting more technology into a smaller package, everything gets a little bit smaller. Sure. Right? So uh, as Jonathan already described, um, you know, the, you know, we've kept this, you know, one of the things that our customers love about our product is this iconic charger. Uh, so this pebble-shaped form. Um, 
Uh, people like playing with it, you know, the magnetic closure. It just it feels good in your hand. It feels good in your pocket easily. You know, fits in your pocket, fits in your purse. Uh, and so that was that was important. Now, if you're traveling, you're going on vacation, you're going to work. Exactly. It's a very easy thing to put in your pocket. Right. And it's and the important things was to to move the technology along uh, while sim simultaneously uh, keeping the brand uh, iconic, but also driving things a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so the the biggest benefit from my vantage point, because you know hearing is kind of at the of the center of my universe, is is what we're doing on the acoustic side, right? And that came from really two elements of the design. One was the the amount of gain and, and output that we're able to drive uh, from the device itself. And importantly, the other element of that is this new flexi palm design. Uh, so, you know, our design goal relative to this tip design was improving comfort, uh, improving the acoustic fit, and reducing migration, right? So the ability, you know, as people's jaws move, the ear canal moves a little bit, and there can be a tendency of something in your ear canal to work its way out a little right. bit, right? So we wanted a little bit better retention. Can, can you actually measure that? Is there a, a scientific way to measure you know, other than asking the person, this feels you know less, more comfortable than the previous one. But is there a scientific way to measure so that? So it's part. It's part of our. I mean, it, from a test perspective, yes, and from you know clinical trials are part and parcel of what we need to do, right? So we've got a dedicated clinical team, mm -hmm. and that's all they do is work on validation of specific design elements, and then ultimately the entire system. Uh, and so the you know this tip design was one of the early incarnations in this round of development. Uh, we had you know five different concept designs. We moved forward with three of them, and this one won hands down. Right, mm -hmm. Re you know, was substantially more comfortable, substantially better acoustic fit, and reduced that migration. Right, and that's really captured clinically is the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from a um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things I know people are, are the, it's probably the first series of questions they ask when they encounter a product like this. Let's talk about battery life, how long it takes to charge, a day in the life of a user using the Ergon uh, Neo, and what sure. kind of you know what benefits it has associated with it. Sure. So uh, you know we were we are were the first and still remain the only rechargeable uh, in the ear device on the market mm -hmm. today, and that's critically important. And so. The battery life of the device itself uh, is guaranteed to have uh, over 16 hours on a daily use. Uh, and so it, practically all day. Yeah. People are not up And then that hours means nom nominally, really, that's 20 hours of use right out of the gate. We guarantee that 16 hours of use after two to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, what's required uh, from a design perspective. Um, and the charger itself allows for up to seven days of charge without recharging the charger. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can take it on vacation, you know, um, and without worrying about bringing a cable to plug it in. And that's an interesting consideration because I think you know, with all the exposure that the AirPods have gotten, and you know, the AirPod people will know that concept that you know, I, I can right. just bring that little charger with me, and it's, it's constantly charging right. the AirPods as long as the, as, as, as the little docking station is charged. So, um, and how is that charged through USB, or how is that? Uh... Yeah, it's a USB-C uh, connection. Uh, so it's you know, the nice thing about USB-C is either way is okay, <laughs> and uh, and that's a important you know. So that ease of use is paramount in sure. everything we do. So every little nuance of of what we do, even the insertion of, of the device. So if you look at the evolution from the Ergo Max and Ergo Plus to the Ergo Neo. You know, you'll notice that the uh, this the cradle for the devices has flipped a little bit, and mm -hmm. that's uh, intentional so that uh, the device simply just can't go in incorrectly. Right. Uh, you'd really have to work at it to you know put it in upside down. Mm -hmm. uh, the lid, even the lid closure, right, uh, allows you know if you don't have it seated perfectly, the lid will. Position it. Perfectly. Get that nice tactile click exactly. when it's put in place properly. Correctly, and then mm -hmm. the LEDs. We've also reworked the LEDs so that they're very simple and intuitive to to discern what's going on. Mm -hmm. right? So if there's a, you know, if you don't have it seated correctly, you'll quickly know uh, mm -hmm. by looking at the device. So how was set up then? You know, but and maybe actually almost. Um, I want to turn it over to John, give yep. him a little bit of, uh, some airtime on this. But how does someone go? If they, you know, they, they're excited. They take it out of the box. Give me a quick two or three minute overview of how it's actually someone actually physically sets it up, and we'll talk about the app and the the connectivity piece with that. But let's go through that. Uh, it is 
extremely simple. You take it out, you put it in your ear, it automatically fires up. So, I mean, in a real-time demo, this is how it works. And then if you want to, you can charge it up, get your full week of juice, mm -hmm. and that's it. Beyond that, it's really just doing the... Typing on the ear to adjust the, the, the noise sensitivity levels. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's as simple as that. And that's important because, you know, you know, people don't stay in their house all day. They listen to TV, they go to the movie theater, they go to, they go to different places, you know, and, uh, you know, the, being able to adjust the sound that simplistically, I think, is an important deal. Right. So let's talk a little bit about um, the app itself. Sure. You know what it can do. You 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 know successfully highlighted to him that you know you you know if you have a device embedded in the ear, right? It's they're, 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 it's impossible to have a Bluetooth connection, and the last thing you right. want to do is run <laughs> run an antenna outside the ear. Right. That wouldn't be the right design thing to do. But let's talk about the the the, the app itself and. Uh, yeah. So the app itself really is there to make life a little bit easier for for the end user. Um, so. As we, as we described, right, the, the default experience right, has four profiles, four programs that you can switch between an acoustic tap. Most users, after two or three days or sometimes a week of use, realize that you know, there's really one or two programs that I'm using all the time. Some people it's one, some people it's two. Very, very rare that people are using three or four programs. So one of the first things that the app allows you to do is just simply disable those programs that you're not using. Mm -hmm. Right, so rather than having to cycle through four programs with an acoustic tap, you can bounce back and forth between those two programs. Right. Right. Uh, the other important feature of of the app is uh, every time you plug in your charger or plug in the hearing aids into the charger, we're d taking the data logs uh, in the hearing aids. So we're logging use, we're logging the acoustic uh, environments people are in on a minute by minute basis. And all of that information is stored in the charger. Uh, so we have a big chunk of flash memory, and we're storing that every time they plug it back in. Uh, when they're connected to their cell phone, we use the cell phone as a gateway to push that data to our cloud service. Uh, so we're aggregating data um, from every user. So if they call up our PHP, our personal hearing professionals, uh, to because they have an issue or because they, you know, they say everything is great except when I'm at Starbucks um, and the personal hearing professional can look at those data logs and say, hey, I noticed that, you know, that, that environment is pretty loud. Uh, let's add a little bit of noise reduction to your favorite memory mm -hmm. uh, to improve that environment. And they can literally uh, click a button within a web app that pushes that change to the the device. down to the charger. They plug the hearing aids in the charger for five seconds, take them back out, and voila, we've pushed a change. So that personalization that's is, is uh, I think, absolutely key. Yeah, and, and, and that's really, really incredible that, you know, it's, it's personalizing and customizing performance at, a, at an end user level, which I think is uh, terrific. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left here, and I, I want to talk about futures. You know, without you opening up the kimono and saying, hey, Mark, here's our product roadmap. A couple of questions is that at a high level, you know, where do you think the category is going where next generation, so maybe not one that, that later this year or next year, but you know, where do you see, where would you like to see further enhancements and further improvement at a macro level? I mean, we talked a little bit about this as, as the product seems to have a bit of AI mm -hmm. built into it, you know, right. given, given the cloud um, dimension of the product. But right. uh, first and foremost, let me just ask you, um, Tim, where do you think the, uh, from a product standpoint, where are we going with this, and what do you think that you guys will be focused on? The in the short term, uh, it is really about adding uh, functionality into the mobile app, right? mm -hmm. so that allowing the end user more and more personalization and doing that in a in an intelligent way. So keeping that user interface dirt simple, mm -hmm. right? You simply cannot get it wrong because we're not giving you a 20 band equalizer to start playing around with. Yep. We're keeping that interface very, very simple, but empowering the end user to make small and meaningful modifications to their profile. Uh, longer term, it gets a lot more exciting, right? Obviously, invisibility is core to who we are, uh, and you know, we're not a one-trick pony, so we've got a very aggressive uh, roadmap, uh, sure. and we'll continue to innovate both on the size and on the personalization piece, and I think that that's, that's core to the category. Sure. Tim mentioned uh, 
invisibility is a big focus, and that's that's one of our core values. So invisibility, comfort, and price are kind of the main founding principles of Virgo, and what we're doing on the product side is only going to push that story further. So, um, you know, we're working on how do we make the device smaller, how do we make it more comfortable, and how do we build it in such a way where we can have the ability to reduce price, right? Um, so a lot of work um, goes into simplifying the design to enable that and mm -hmm. to really bake it down to what is the core essence of this product to make it as tiny as possible, as comfortable as possible. But beyond that, like how do we build in more features for the customer, right? So we're working on a lot of exciting things in order to make you know a better product experience for the end user. Um, and I think uh, you know what we're cooking is pretty exciting. Sure. Well, it's really incredible. And the only personal note that I'll make is that uh, the way I got introduced to Ergo is my mom starting to add for your product about a year ago and well I was able to get one for her and it really has changed your life and you know to the conversation we were having at the beginning of the podcast is that it really is you know it, you don't often get a chance to work on a product in Silicon Valley that really are changing people's lives you know I mean there's a lot of great technology and there's a lot of great mm -hmm. products for, for, for entertainment and you know other type of productivity um, uh, things but when you have a, a product that really enhances the way people live their daily lives, that's a pretty amazing thing. So thank you for your time, John, Tim, uh, and thank you to the uh, more Insights Strategy audience. Uh, please follow our podcast um, on Apple iTunes, and uh, please have a great weekend, and thanks again.